Hi everyone, welcome back. Flight testing update. So it's been a good week. Uh, you know, early on in flight testing, you kind of just don't get to fly as much as you'd like. The weather, uh, other interruptions, but uh, anyway, a little over three hours now. It's pretty exciting. Uh, and speaking of that, somebody asked if I was happy and I guess it doesn't come through, but Sunday when I finished flying, we had the helicopter parked outside and I was kind of sitting on the deck looking at it and realized, well, this is kind of amazing. I actually have a flying helicopter here that we built. So uh, yes, I am excited it, and it flies just wonderfully. I had to get the hang of it and you know, not hold anything back on these videos, but the first First hour or so, it's totally different than the Switzer. It's a heavier, bigger helicopter. I have not flown one that's quite this large and heavy, but it's certainly more stable. And the power is just really, really nice. It's uh, you know over 285 horsepower here available, and it's just me in it right now, even though I have done some ballasting, as I mentioned, to kind of make certain it's loaded the way I flew it, and then eventually I'll start ballasting up the helicopter to even heavier weights. But uh, for those of you who are considering building one of these things, because I get a lot of emails, boy, I want to do one, or how's it going, I'm really interested, I would encourage you to get started because it's a really, really fun machine. I, I can't wait to get Carol in it. Uh, and got a bunch of other friends who want rides as well. So uh, yeah, go for it. It's pretty exciting, all right? I'm, I'm actually hoping somebody doesn't pinch me and wake me up. We, we do have one and it's working and it's fine. So let me tell you some of the things we've been going through. It's flight test, right? So uh, it's, a, it's a totally new engine installation with an FM300 from Airflow Performance. So, uh, you know, I've changed out the jet now. I'm going on the second jet. I'm going to try. I'm trying to get the EGTs down a little bit. The uh, uh, CHTs were initially kind of high. New engine would expect that, and especially since I'm doing hovering where you're carrying more power in a helicopter and a hover than you really are in, uh, you know, once you get some effective translational lift and you're doing some cruising, which I haven't done a whole lot. I think I've gone around the pattern now about a dozen times. And I'm gonna tell you about something I figured out with that in a second. But anyway, we're just kind of enriching that jet a little bit at a time to get those EGTs down more in line. Luckily, I have an RB10 here that basically has the same engine in it with the same setup. It's a Thunderbolt engine, same compressions, and same uh, pretty much fuel controller, servo, it's all airflow performance stuff. So uh, um, I love the EGTs at idle and power settings on the RV-10, so I'm trying to match those with the helicopter, even though we're running this one at substantially higher RPMs, you know, 500 more RPMs there at pickup and throughout the rest of the flight. So I'm trying to figure out where they should match. Uh, coupled with a new engine, but uh, we'll get there. So I started out, give you some idea, we started out with a number 42 jet and I changed that to a 40 and a half. And this morning I'm gonna put a 40 in it. I've been uh, uploading the data there to Savvy Analysis and looking at it. And so, uh, yeah, I just wanna get the EGTs down a little bit. So let's see, some of the flight testing things. Uh, one of the things I noticed, I'm finally relaxing a little bit, like Sunday when I told you I just really enjoyed this helicopter. I had a great time. I must have gone out there and picked it up and sat it down about a dozen times. And it picks up very nice and straight and settles down very nicely. It's kind of a hoot taxi in a helicopter and that's made flight testing much easier for me in this one actually, because I taxied it out to the runway where we've got run mat and this time of year there's not much grass on it so you get a little bit of forgiveness if you do slide a little bit uh, with the helicopter but it's given me a lot more room to practice those pickup and set downs. Probably the first couple I needed that room uh, now it's just up and down very very nicely but then I can taxi it back, back to the house it's it's it is kind of neat. Uh, one of the things to do have to pay attention to is when you engage the rotors and you shut down the rotors or you back off the throttle when you set down because of the torque and you're on wheels, it will swing the nose. So you kind of got to pay attention there. Um, but boy, it is nice taxing it. Did I tell you it's neat taxing a helicopter? Anyway, so, so one of the things I noticed was, you know, when you dip the nose down to go to forward flight is uh, at the end of the runway, even though I was carrying about 23, 24 inches of manifold pressure, I was only getting about 45, 50 knots. And so I got to the end and said, well, we're gonna climb anyway. And climb rate was very, very nicely. You know, what I've seen so far is 900 feet a minute or so there. And uh, finally, you know, I, this airspeed just didn't seem right to me as I, on the down when I started carrying more and more power to get the airspeed up and it just was not accelerating. It didn't make any sense to me. And a light bulb finally went off in my head. Maybe I should look at these instruments and see what's going on. And sure enough, I glanced at the ground speed 
And it was about 25 knot difference. And I thought, well, there is a, there is a tailwind right now. So I turned around and sure enough, uh, I still had about 20 knot difference between airspeed and ground speed, which now explains to me, even though I was coming down final at it indicated, you know, 40 something knots, it looked fast to me, even though it's a different sight picture in this helicopter. So I came down, got my pitot static tester out, and sure enough, the pitot tube had a leak. And listen to what I said, the pitot tube had a leak, not the pitot system, which was, you know, for those of you building, putting your own systems in, I, no different than you, I questioned, boy, what did I do here? And I, I teed into the uh, pitot tube, right behind the pitot tube in the battery compartment up here. You can walk around here and we'll show you the pitot tube so you can see what I'm talking about. But it's, it's this pitot tube. It's actually a certified pitot tube off of a R44 helicopter. It's called a Raven pitot tube here. Say it again. What's it called? It's a Raven pitot tube. Raven. Okay. Yeah, Raven pitot tube. And so it's recommended. That's what uh, Brad Clark of Vertical Aviation has on his. And so you can kind of see it inside the cockpit there where the two uh, hoses come up for both static and pitot. When I put the pitot tester on here, big leak. Uh, well, I got a problem. So I split it behind the pitot tube to check everything I did in the aircraft, and guess what? No leaks. It was, it was pretty solid. So that was interesting. So then what I did was block off the pitot tube and put the tester coming into the pitot tube, and the pitot tube was leaking. How the heck does a pitot tube leak? So it turns out there are some fittings on the backside, which I did install for both the static line and the pitot line, and I actually pulled them back out, retaped them, put them back in, still had a leak. Hmm. So uh, anyway, I started trying to figure out how could a pitot tube leak, and I just happened idly, my hand rubbing this uh, front portion of the pitot tube, and it spun off in my hand. It turns out this thing is assembled inside, and I don't remember any directions telling me to tighten this down or seal it, but guess what I did? Took it all apart, put thread sealant on everything, put it all back together, leak is gone. So I'm anxious to fly it and see what the airspeed is now. So that should make a big change there. And I think I'm going to have a much faster helicopter too. So that part's exciting. Uh, so for those of you, the lesson there is for those of you who think your airspeed might be reading a little low on the aircraft you built, you might want to check the pitot system. I thought I had checked it, actually, because um, I know I checked the static system for leaks when I did it. So I don't know if I just had the pitot test around there and didn't notice it was leaking or this may have vibrated and come more loose during the flight testing. Regardless, it's fixed. Uh, unfortunately, the weather's not cooperative now for the next few days to go test some things. So let's see, past that, um, I think I mentioned, you know, this is a helicopter, there's a lot of moving parts and everything. So do spend a lot of time uh, checking blades, checking connections, uh, make sure everything's tight. So far, the engine compartment, everything's good, haven't had any leaks. One of the things I did notice, though, is, uh, again, three flight hours in, so maybe three and a half, four hours of engine runtime. I decided to check the gascolator and pull it apart. We'll put a picture of that in there for you. But I was surprised at how much the screen in the gascolator was blocked. And you'll see the way a gascolator works is it comes in, uh, the fuel, and then it comes back up through this screen. That helps separate the water and dirt. And then there's a little outlet that comes up to the rest of the airplane. That outlet was, I was shocked at how much it was actually blocked. You'll see it in the picture. So I decided, you know what, that screen's got, not got enough surface area for me, um, especially since this is not a metal tank. So there weren't any metal shavings, all just lint and everything. Uh, my guess is from cleaning out the inside of the fuel bladder, even though I wiped it out multiple times. It could be from the manufacturing process. So anyway, I've now added an airflow performance fuel filter just as the fuel exits the tank prior to it getting to the gas escalator. So that's going to help filter that fuel and protect that line. The airflow performance filters, you'll see it, they're quite large with a large surface area. I've ran those in the RV-10 and other airplanes for years. I've never seen one of them get anywhere near any blockage on them. So that should eliminate the worry on that part. And uh, I don't know, I can't think of anything else that we've done during flight testing to date. Uh, can you, Carol? Nope. Nope, okay. So anyway, that's where we're at. Uh, I'm excited and kind of frustrated with the weather. It is March in Atlanta, so it tends to be windy. And, uh, you know, I'm kind of eliminating any flight testing during uh, high winds. I like to keep it between, you know, less than 10, 12 knots anyway. As long as it's down the runway, I'm okay with that. 
And uh, so I'm at three hours, as I mentioned. I'm staying in the pattern right now. I just always had a practice of five hours near the airport. And uh, so after five hours, I hope to uh, you know, spread the wings a little bit and maybe head out to a couple other airports. So anyway, thanks for watching. Stay with us and we'll keep you updated.